Alex here with part 4 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As with my previous videos, I'd like to take this opportunity to direct my viewers to part 0 if you haven't seen it yet. That's the video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are, number one, I'm not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. It cannot be reopened. And that's because my ex's parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the underlying purpose of the series is to give my viewers one big example of my eight year long high conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. I think my mindset at this point was still um, in the negative. I was probably not as concerned when it came to preparing the appeal because I'd already prepared an appeal and it was still pending. Um, not too happy probably about how long I had been waiting. I didn't have a clue how long appeals really took at that point in time. In fact, it's very inconsistent even now. In hindsight, I can't say that they all took a long time because there were two of my appeals that took only three months. So some of them were very quick. But in this particular situation, I I was hopeful. I think I was probably suspecting or expecting that I would win this appeal. And that's because I read the Rivero case and the court was able to take the action that I had asked the court to take according to the Rivero case. So I probably was imagining that it was going to be an appeal that I won, but it's hard to be certain given that it's been 10 years since this point in time. I think at this point we should actually just go ahead and get into what I have filed. <laughs> Here we have the Civil Proper Person Appeal Statement. This is one of those self-help forms that is prepared custom by the Supreme Court, so a little different from another typical self-help form where you have to you know, fill in a few things. This one is prepared ahead of time, custom just for you, and then mailed to you. Here's the instructions. As with the previous appeal that I went over, I'm not going to cover the instructions. You'll be able to click down in the description below on a link to download this document. And if you have questions about these instructions, you can go ahead and post them down in the comments below. First section, I identify the order that I am appealing. And here I correctly identify the order denying motion. Next, I indicate the date that I filed the notice of appeal. The reason they're asking this is to see if they have jurisdiction. And I filed it within three days of that order. So that's correct as well. Uh, has to be done within 30 days in Nevada. And there's all kinds of exceptions for different types of cases. Related cases, we have CV09. Okay, so this is the case against the Secretary of State, which is good. Issues on appeal, child custody visitation, which is also correct. Statement of facts. This is supposed to be a detailed statement of facts, but it looks like I did a very brief statement of facts. Now, I know I did this because I filed an opening brief separately, but if you were just going to fill this form out in the way that they intended, you would actually have the entire statement of facts in this section, and it would be in detail, and this would kind of basically fill the role of the opening brief that would be filed by an attorney. Statement of District Court Error. I'm not going to go over this in detail because, as I mentioned earlier, I actually attach an opening brief. And down here, you can see that I even reference it. I state right here, I attached an opening brief. So in that opening brief, there's going to be a detailed list of facts. And there's also going to be a detailed assertions of law with citations and all of that. So all of this stuff here that I wrote by hand, this chicken scratch, is going to be covered in detail in the opening brief anyway. Rather than go over it twice, we're just going to hold off because it's going to be the next document that I cover anyway. Certificate of service. I checked this box indicating that I served this document upon nobody. There's no details here. This section here, right in the middle, this gigantic gap, is supposed to be where I put down my ex's attorney's address. So I wonder if this ends up backfiring on, uh, backfiring on me because you're supposed to not just say, hey, I served them. You're supposed to say, this is precisely how I served them. <clears throat> and that wasn't um, detailed here. So I think this is all, yeah, we're going on to the next document. 
This is the opening brief that I was talking about earlier. This is the document that I prepared custom, and this is the document that we're gonna go over in more detail. First paragraph, I identify myself as the appellant. I didn't really need to put down that I was the father there, but I, I did. And I am, let's see here, indicating that I, by the way, this cover isn't right. They, the way that opening briefs are filed in the Supreme Court is different. And this introductory paragraph isn't typically used. Typically, it just has the name of the parties involved in the appeal and their attorneys. So I just wanted to make sure that I stated that this isn't really how lawyers file opening briefs in an appeal. Table of contents. So I break it down. This is also required by the rules of appellate procedure. This is not just something that I'm doing to be nice. In the rules of appellate procedure, opening briefs need to contain a table of contents and a table of authorities. And as you can probably guess, the table of contents breaks it down into sections and indicates to the Supreme Court which page number each section begins on. Table of authorities, really, really light. Two statutes and two laws. I don't know, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, my later appeals are much more thorough, but uh, let's go ahead and take a look. So we've got the statement of oh, memorandum of points and authorities. This usually isn't included here either, this, this line here. Um, statement of issues, whether delegating decision-making power between the parents requires a modification of legal custody. Okay, well, that is a modification of legal custody in and of itself. So I already know that's wrong. <laughs> the second issue, whether the district court abused its discretion by refusing to consider the specific dynamics and precedent of the in instant case. And then issue number three, which is whether the district court erred in finding that my allegations, even if true, fail to warrant a delegation of parental duties. Okay, that one is the one that I'm most interested in taking a look at. We'll get further into, into this uh, document. Case statement. This is supposed to be a brief statement of the case. I, henceforth, father, filed a complaint against my ex. I really didn't. I filed a petition um, to establish custody over our common child. And... Let's see here. I petitioned for joint physical and joint legal custody. She petitioned for sole physical and joint legal custody. I don't know why this this isn't relevant. I mean, you could I could have probably started off with the court's order. I didn't have to probably mention this this specific. I guess I'm trying to argue that she is opposing me being involved from the very beginning. I guess that might be why I included that, but it doesn't jump to mind to me as something that they would care about. The 26th of May. After two failed attempts at mediation, the court entered a decision awarding physical and legal custody to us jointly. Next assertion is that following the court's decision, a number of motions arose as we remained unable to cooperate, including a motion to compel income tax claims being alternated, a motion to compel her to turn over medical information, a motion to establish a procedure, a motion to impose sanctions for contempt, a motion to modify child support, and finally, the motion that is the subject of this appeal, the motion to delegate parental duties. I filed a motion to delegate parental duties on the 12th of October. Um, I argued that we could not cooperate and the court could not create parental cooperation. Um, my ex filed an opposition. I filed a reply and the court entered an order denying, I filed my appeal. So that's basically the list of facts. The argument is that, let's take a look here. The district court stated that my motion alleges that she subverts my rights as a parent. And I'm asking the court to give me sole decision-making power. This is all, we've talked about this. My motion's denied. Um, it appears that the district court neglected to review the citation, Rivero v. Rivero, or erroneously interpreted the Supreme Court's determination. The relevant paragraph states, and here's where I go into the Supreme Court um, actually stating what I'm asking for, which is that they can delegate decision-making authority regarding certain areas of legal custody. Um, the next... Let's see here. The next assertion is that the Supreme Court no, in no way implies that legal custody needs to be altered. It just elaborates. Okay, so it's fine that they don't specifically state this. They don't spell it out, but that's what you're doing. You're altering legal custody when you, you ask or when you successfully get the court to delegate um, these decision-making authorities. That's exactly what the court's doing. The court refused to consider my allegations on the grounds that the allegations, even if true, were insufficient to warrant a change of legal custody. And I'm holding that this is an abuse of discretion. I'm outlining a factual background rife with non-cooperative conduct. Um, my ex 
would schedule appointments, give me a day's notice. Um, my ex would give me sufficient notice only to resort to attempting to incite conflict at the appointments themselves. So this is my background in support of what I'm asking for. The law dictates that the public policy of the state in child custody matters is to serve the best interests of the children. Idealistically, two parents can get along. However, it doesn't mean that the court presumes that it can force cooperation. And this is true. Just because that's the ideal situation doesn't mean that the court can make everyone do that. That's just the ideal situation. That's just the most common situation. It's, there's still going to be exceptions. There's still going to be situations where certain families can't do that. And the court has to figure out how to deal with those problems specifically. Not just try to um, shoehorn those dysfunctional relationships into a functional ideal, which is kind of, well, not kind of, which is for sure what the court's trying to do. The court's trying to say that this is the way it's supposed to work, so make it work. Rather than assess my motion and resolve the conflict, the court denies the delegation of parental duties and arbitrarily urges us to go to yet another parenting class. So apparently this is another parenting class that we've been sent to, so I can't even remember the first one. Um, it's rendered the district court predictable and rigid. In denying a delegation of parental duties, the only remaining legal remedy is contempt against my ex, which is true, but it's definitely not the ideal way to solve this problem. I explain why in the video. Um, it's not gotcha litigation. It's uh, many fine lines. That's the video that addresses this kind of problem. Um, content, holding someone in contempt is difficult to do, and it comes from the perspective of violating a court's order, not from the best interest of the child. And so it's very limited as to what you can do with a motion for order to show cause. So I'm indicating that just giving up to my ex's subversion of my involvement would serve to reward her conduct, which is in contradiction from what the Supreme Court stated in Mosley v. Figliuzzi. Um, our son is entering into new situations when he attends his doctor and dentist appointments to him. They are very new and strange procedures and will already be elevating his stress level to force him to deal with the added stress of two parents who cannot get along. <clears throat> Combined with whatever stress the parental conflict may be passing on to his healthcare practitioners is definitely not in his best interest. Conclusion. <clears throat> I am requesting that the Supreme Court reverse the district court's order denying and remand the matter with instructions to delegate parental decision-making authority. Here's an affirmation, as with my previous documents. It's just indicating to the clerk of the Supreme Court that this document does not contain a social security number. Affidavit, which is verifying the document under oath. Exhibits, that's weird. Should not have exhibits in an opening brief, and that's because there's going to be a record on appeal that's transmitted. Um, these two particular exhibits we've already gone over anyway, so according to my ordinary policy of not going over things that we've already gone over, I'm going to skip them, but I do want to mention to my viewers, you shouldn't be attaching exhibits to an opening brief. Um, there may be extremely rare exceptions when you can um, include other things into the record on appeal, and I'm not even sure that's how they look at it. I think the way they look at it is taking judicial notice of other things that have occurred, and it's very different Next document, order directing transmission of the record and directing myself to properly serve notice. So the Supreme Court is indicating they reviewed the documents on file. They've concluded that the complete a review of the complete record is warranted. So I passed the first screening phase and they are telling the um, clerk of the lower court to transmit the district or the trial court record. And this is the rule that they cite. Yeah, that applies to people who are representing themselves, which is, um, it provides that the complete record should be sent up to the Supreme Court as opposed to an appendix, which is what will typically be filed when you have an attorney. And let's take a look a little bit further. Um, by the way, this first screening, I don't think it has much to do with the merits of the case. I think they only look to see if they have jurisdiction of the appeal. And then if they do, they let it through. And then they're going to screen it again a second time prior to letting my ex know whether or not she has to file a response in the appeal. Having reviewed the notice of appeal and the civil proper person appeal statement filed, it appears that I have not properly served the documents on my ex and the certificate of service is not fully completed. Okay, so yeah, this is what I talked about earlier. It's blank, it has a gigantic gap where I should have filled in the address. 
So exactly, that's exactly what they're mentioning here. So they're just telling me, they're ordering me to uh, serve those documents on my ex and or file a proof of service slash certificate of service. So the documents were served on her, I just didn't file a valid certificate of service. So I'm sure that I probably just went and did that. I just prepared the certificate of service and, and filed it in this Supreme Court docket. I have 15 days to properly serve the notice of appeal and civil proper person appeal statement. Within that uh, time period, I shall file a properly completed certificate of service for each of those documents and that fully comply with the uh, rules of appellate procedure. Caution that a, a failure to do so will result in dismissal of the appeal. This is boilerplate. They include this in every order that they file, um, especially civil, uh, sorry, especially a proper person litigants, litigants who are representing themselves. Because they need to let you know, you need to do this or we can't process your appeal and we're going to have to just close your case. With attorneys, it's different. They'll usually threaten to sanction them, like monetarily or report them to the state bar. With non-attorneys, this is typically all they can do is just throw the case out. Receipt for documents from the Supreme Court, and this is something that I believe we already went over in the oh well this is for the record of appeal documents anyway this is court to court communication i'm not going to spend any time on this notice of urgency so i am letting the supreme court and my ex know that this issue is urgent and i'm not even asking for anything i'm just letting the court know that it's urgent this is a superfluous filing i didn't need to file this i shouldn't have filed this it's just it's pointless it adds one more document to the docket it's a waste of everyone's time don't do stuff like this i don't know why i did this I probably assumed that they would take a really, really long time because my other appeal was taking a long time and I didn't want that to happen with this appeal. I probably wanted this one to move along a little bit more quickly. And here we have the affirmation, which is, as mentioned previously, just indicating to the clerk that I checked the document for social security numbers. Proof of service. This is what they asked me to sign. Well, this is what they ordered me to file. And I am complying with their order and I'm filing the proof of service, which is detailing that. The civil proper person appeal statement, the case appeal statement, and the notice of appeal, as well as my opening brief, were served upon my ex's attorney uh, personally, personally in bold, which means that I physically took the papers to the law office and gave them to a staffer that was working there. Another affirmation. Here we have my ex's attorney's notice of non-availability. This is probably the same one. It's just filed in the Supreme Court. And as I mentioned in my previous video, it's probably because she went on a vacation or something. Notice of non-availability is actually the title of one of my videos. You can take a look at that video if you want to learn a little bit more about what's implicated when an attorney files one of these notices. Certificate of mailing, indicating that my ex's attorney mailed this document to my old address. And that is in compliance with Rule 5 of the rules of, well, wait a minute. This is a Supreme Court filing, so you wouldn't use Rule 5 to justify this filing. So this is wrong, but it doesn't matter because they have a similar rule of appellate procedure in our AP that allows them to do the same thing anyway. So even though they cited the wrong rule, they did the right thing anyway. They're allowed to mail this to me. Order granting motion to expedite appeal. I never filed a motion. Okay, so okay, I see what they're doing. So the notice of urgency, they are taking that notice and they are construing it as a motion to expedite the matter. And having construed it as a motion, they are granting it. So that's just the Supreme Court saying that they're going to expedite resolution of this appeal to the extent that they can. And going into the aftermath, it looks like I filed one, two, three, four of those documents. And those were all free filings. So I incurred zero dollars in costs. My ex's attorney only filed a notice of non-availability. That's also a free filing. So she incurred zero dollars in costs. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred zero dollars in attorney fees. Um, she probably spent very little time reviewing most of these documents. The receipt for documents, the notice of urgency, and the proof of service, I could probably say five minutes went into those. The order granting, I'm going to just lump those into the other three. So all four of those documents, we're looking at even the order directing, because that wasn't even an order directed to my ex's attorney. So let's just say one minute for each of those documents. So we're looking at five minutes so far. <clears throat> the notice of non-availability, that's going to be a five-minute document. It's, a, it's another one of those short documents, but that one she would have actually had to prepare. So she's not just reviewing it. So we have another five minutes, total of ten minutes so far. We have the civil proper person appeal statement. I'm going to say five minutes for that document. It's got nothing that is substantial and 
um, well, there are those two portions at the end, the facts and the argument on error. Those are substantial, but we end up going through those in the opening brief anyway. So I'm going to say five minutes for that document as well. So we're at 15 documents so far. My opening brief is decent, but it's a little light. I'm only using two statutes and two cases. So it could be one of those documents that would have taken her many, many hours if I had sort of elaborated a whole lot more, but I didn't do that. So I'm going to say just 15 minutes on that document, which is going to take this to a total of 30 minutes, which at the rate of $250 an hour comes to $125 in attorney fees for my ex. As with my previous videos, feel free to post something down in the comments below if you have any questions, and I will see you guys next time.